welcome everyone at the annual reporting session of the Center for Theoretical Physics of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, we have special guests from the Institute of uh, Physics. I see the Deputy Director for Finances, Magda Zawuska Kotur, Professor Magda Zawuska Kotur, of course. And then uh, <laughs> Professor Piotr Dewar just joined, who is the Deputy Director for Science, also in the Institute of uh, Physics, our big brother here. Uh, ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, sorry, okay. Uh, so I propose that we go quickly to the presentations. The plan is as follows. We have two sessions with five talks in each of the session. After that, uh, there will be some food and also poster session. So I propose that uh, we'll start already. The chairman of the first session will be the new deputy director for science, uh, Professor Remigiusz Augusiak. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. So the first speaker of our session is uh, Marek Kusz, who will talk about uh, ambiguities of quantization. Marek, the stage is uh, yours. Okay, thank you very much. So <coughs> I have a privilege to start the session. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay, so the, what I want to talk uh, about is something which is, uh, I would say, a byproduct of the PhD of Kasia kowalczyk morinka Maybe this is, by, the, by no way, this is the, the, the most important result, but this is, a, as I told you, a nice byproduct, and I think it's easy to explain and to understand. That's why I uh, decided to talk about oh. that. Actually, Kasia should have been talking about that, but somehow it is. But let me start from this uh, customary presentation of the something which I learned, or what I learned from our web page, that it is called statutory <laughs> tasks. <laughs> statutory. Uh, so I have full screen, but I think that the, somebody who operates Zoom is uh, responsible for this. I have this at the full screen. Okay, so so the statutory task is called complex quantum systems and their applications, and actually uh, there are three people, or there were three people involved in this <coughs> task. So uh, two PhD students actually uh, at that time. In the meantime, Kasia completed her PhD project with the successful defense of the thesis. And actually there were two projects really <coughs> which were executed by the members of this group. One which was specific, I would say, for the topic. This was the, the um, project financed by a National Science uh, Center, how, how it is called, yes, in English. Um, and it was uh, finished in the, toward the end of the last year. And there is, there is a big uh, project uh, which is obviously executed with other groups. So, so this is so they very shortly about the, our output. So there are some papers published. Uh, there are some preprints which, are, which have been uh, submitted, uh, were submitted uh, not long ago, and uh, there were two promotions. Okay, one promotion, uh, as I already mentioned, by Kasia of Kasia uh, Kowalczyk Murinka, uh, who finished her PhD in, the, in uh, November last year, and the second one, which is hopefully uh, start soon, so the thesis of uh, Janek Głowacki will be delivered in two weeks to the council. Okay, so let's, let us go to this uh, problem we investigated. As I told you, this was somehow on the, I would say, fringe of this main, uh, main topic of Kasia's uh, PhD. And uh, the object of study was a classical uh, system, which is called Calogero model system, which is written here in the first line. 
So this is the Hamilton function of this. This is, uh, we can say this is one dimensional gas and a harmonic potential, but in addition, the particles interact with such a quadratic term. So it was invented by Calogero more than half a century ago. And initially it was uh, conceived as in, in, uh, in quantum mechanical setting actually. And I'll return to this. And then the, um, it is interesting also from the classical point of view. So the, the, the system is nonlinear, nice, and multiparticle, but completely integrable. So we can solve it full. <laughs> full. Uh, what does it mean? So in principle, it means that it is integrable in so-called so Arnold Liouville sense. So it means that there's uh, that we have enough uh, and <coughs> necessary number of integrals of motion, which could be explicitly written, and then they are in involution. So Poisson computing and so on independent. So we can solve it. But uh, okay. So what was actually the object of uh, our study was some generalization of this. And generalization consists of uh, exchanging this uh, universal coupling constant uh, between and this interaction between particles, but something which is uh, um, which uh, the number of uh, additional uh, dynamical variables. Okay, uh, so in this is no longer con these are no longer constant, but they are also evolved dynamically uh, according to this Hamiltonian. So obviously you have to say what what are the Poisson bracket at least of this of this additional SA coupling constants okay and these are uh, in principle you can arrange them in a, in a matrix and this this should be anti anti-symmetric or anti Hermitian matrix depending on on the setting on the symmetry of the system okay one can say that uh, depending on the time uh, symmetry of the system. Uh, okay, so at, at first sight it uh, looks very artificial, why to do so? So <coughs> it is interesting that this particular system is, uh, has some, uh, has some uh, applications and it will be clear what the application is in the next transparency, but I can tell you that uh, I used it and we use it okay, with colleagues for a long time to investigate and a uh, quantum chaotic system. Not this system, but general quantum chaotic systems, and uh, you'll see why. But this is not also so important here. Okay, so why it is uh, interesting. So, as I told you, the system is integrable. Actually, this integrability could be proved in a very simple way, simply by uh, observing that you can, you can reduce a very simple uh, uh, you remember that at the previous uh, transparency there was this harmonic term which I skip here just for simplicity um, is that you you can you can simply uh, look at the free motion in a space of I would say n square variables which are uh, put in the form of a matrix and this is a simple uh, system which is a free motion in this in this in this space so this is like that Okay, and then if you diagonalize x and go to the new variables uh, uh, which are here written, so d, v, and uh, d, d, you define this, this as a commutator as L, so this d, i, so the diagonal elements of d, i, these are all the elements of this, the diagonal uh, elements of this v and uh, this l's are, are actually solve this Hamilton equation of this generalized color Moser system. So, so and obviously this this is a very uh, simple integrable system. So you can write the, the solution and the solution, uh, and then reduce the solution by this diagonalization, and obviously this uh, this integrability property uh, is uh, inherited by the new Hamilton function. Okay. And why it is interesting from the point of view because you can look at this as some kind of a Hamilton uh, uh, Hamilton function or Hamilton sorry, sorry quantum Hamiltonian perturbed by this perturbation why not which is uh, proportional to T and check for example how the eigenvalues okay so these are the the um, diagonal elements of this D evolve in time 
and then you can investigate what is uh, and this this is this was used actually in this uh, uh, quantum uh, chaotic setting so uh, if you and now we want to quantize quantize this 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 classical calorical system why we want to do it, uh, it i will tell you at the very end but let's look at the very f from the uh, point of view of i would say just out of academic curiosity to come back to this this problem of because it started from the from the uh, quantum system so let's see whether uh, something interesting is also in this quantum a quantum uh, version of this system okay so how to quantize so the main the idea is you know we we have this uh, classical uh, system this classical uh, generalized color moser system is obtained from from some reduction from some larger space by a simple diagonalization method okay so let's try to do the same on the quantum level so let's start from the such a free motion or n square on n times n plus one depending whether this is in this uh, orthogonal or unitary setting i will tell you so whether the hermitian or uh, anti hibernation are on anti-symmetric matrices uh, of this L's, and simply start from from the uh, free motion in this space of this so now the 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 elements of this matrix are these quantum operators and they evolve according to this uh, hamiltonian okay and then uh, uh, and then simply change these variables by, diag by attempt to diagonalize this. Okay, and then, and then you obtain the result. Okay, and what is interesting in this result that uh, there is a term which is uh, uh, which depends. It's purely quantum term, I would say. Why purely quantum? I will say in one word which depends on the symmetry of the system. So this alpha is one for, for uh, say, time reversal invariant system, and two for time uh, reversal invariant system. And you see that it vanishes in the second case. Okay, so why it is something when, why is this ambiguity? Because you can see, okay, let's do something much simpler. So let's start from this original uh, classical color model system. And then, say, apply such kind of Dirac quantization. So this is this. So obviously, we will not have this term. So we have this additional term. And depending on the, I would say, way, how do we uh, want to quantize this? And this is interesting. You can also extend this a little bit uh, with some physical meaning to alpha equal 4, which corresponds to uh, symplectic uh, matrices rather than orthogonal and uh, unitary and uh, so uh, so the problem is that we have two different things depending on how do we quantize this so should we bother about this so not really okay because further is no consistent it's known that there's no consistent quantization scheme according to this Dirac uh, prescription uh, and it is very old something uh, connected to something uh, like what is called van hove grunewald theorem it is also uh, extended to some compact uh, uh, classical manifolds in this case this is this 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 manifold of this uh, uh, matrices which is this is the lie algebra this else and, and then there are some possible collections with some phenomena which are known also from the from investigating uh, integrability on the uh, level of uh, quantum mechanics then there are systems which are classically integrable but uh, they have say correct quantum mechanical correspondent but you have add some corrections uh, do, to integrals of motion and also to the hamiltonian and this is similar to this case but uh, why we should not bother because actually what is interesting is definitely some quantum mechanical motivation for such a investigating such such systems. And in our case, it was so. So, actually, the original starting point was some uh, analogies with uh, our connections to quantum Hall effect, where the where the, hmm, the this is the when because it is known that or can be shown that the Laughlin function for such a multi-particle 
uh, Hall system is a ground state of this Hamiltonian, okay? So in our case, this will be substituted by some additional degrees of freedom, something like that. But this is a work in progress. Thank you very much. That's all what I wanted to say. Okay, thank you, Marek, for this nice talk and keeping the time. So there is uh, time for one quick question. Okay, if there are no questions, let's thank Marek again. And the next speaker of the session is uh, Oscar, and he will talk about uh, random walks and quantum computing. Oscar, the stage is yours. Good morning. So uh, I present topic number seven. So here some information about this topic. So the topic leader, implementers. There are two groups involved in this project, and here are all the people that are on those groups. Um, and uh, but the title of today's talk is Random Walks on Compact Groups and Quantum Computing, and this is what uh, the three of us are doing. So Adam Savitsky, uh, me, Professor Adam Savitsky, me, and uh, Piotr Dulian. So I will start from some motivation. What are we studying and, and why? So we are interested in so-called uh, spectral gaps, of set gap S of some uh, sets which are the universal sets of quantum gates. I will explain it uh, later, but this is like what we are studying, gap S, but also gap RS, which is uh, a version of this gap, which is um, up to a, let's say, finite scale. So why we study those things? This is because they provide us some information about the efficiency of, universals of, of, of quantum circuits that are built out of this universal set S. Namely, they say something about the, the length of circuits required to approximate arbitrary uh, unitary, so arbitrary quantum circuit, or maybe quantum gate, let's, let's think of qubits or two qubit gates, uh, using these elements from S, right? This gap R. Uh, and if so actually, yes, what I said is that gap R is interesting because of that. And also, if we are able, we are able to calculate gap S, then we are, which is very hard, mm, that would allow us to tell whether the scaling is optimal or not. Because as you know from solovaiki taiev theorem, the scaling is like log to power 3, 1 over epsilon, but the asymptotically tight scaling is of the form O log 1 over epsilon. And if the gap exists, it turns out that the scaling is optimal. I will explain it also. So, um, so, uh, so as you know, uh, quantum circuits are built out of gates, which has some local dimension. And it is useful in the setting to think of quantum circuits, or let's say qu uh, one or two qubit quantum gates, as some words over an alphabet, which, is, uh, which are elements from, from a SU group of some of the dimension D. So in practice, we consider one or two qubit gates because any circuit can be built out of two qubit gates. And um, yeah, so our alphabet will be a subset of usually of SU2 or SU4, but in general, it is some SUD. So uh, what is the universal set of gates? The set is universal uh, if provided that if I pick any operation, so some unitary in UD and epsilon ball around it, and I will consider words built out of S, so those uh, red dots, which are elementary operation in the S, and I will start increasing the length of words. At some point, I will hit the ball, which means that I am able to epsilon approximate any operation. Okay, and now in the, to in the title, there is some walk. So where is this walk? The walk is on S regular trees, which, for example, on Cayley, on Cayley graphs of of uh, the groups generated by this um, by uh, this uh, set S. So, for example, if we pick, we are usually picking symmetric sets. So, if we pick two generators together with inverses, we will have such a. And there are no relations that will be the Cayley graph of a free group, and uh, the walk is the uniform walk on this graph. Okay, and. Uh, we can ask a question after how many steps of this walk the, the, um, this measure, which is the 
of convolution of the initial measure, which is just the counting measure of this initial set of generators in the group, will be close to the uniform distribution. And to do that, we need a notion of a spectral gap. But just me recall quickly that, uh, recall what I said, that the Solo from solovic itayev theorem, we know that uh, this, this length is, is uh, sufficient for epsilon approximation of any element from SUD. Um, but uh, we can ask a question which S give an optimal scaling, and at least those with so-called spectral gap, they give this lower bound. Um, but the problem is that it's very hard to say the, if the spectral gap exists. And I will just tell you why. Um, because well, what is the spectral gap? So in order to calculate the spectral gap of our set S, we pr introduce uh, the averaging operator TS, which averages functions uh, as follows. So it just shifts uh, the, f the shifts using all elements from S and calculates the average at point H. So we'll get average function. And we can um, we can compare this, aver this averaging operator with the operator that just averages over the uh, the har um, har measure, right? And the gap is just one minus the difference in the operator norm between those two, which means that um, which, which it means that gap quantifies the difference between averaging over har measure and averaging uh, using uh, our set S. Uh, 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 words out of uh, which are built out of set S, because uh, the all the words of length L are built out of S. The averaging over them corresponds to the Lth power of S, and the difference between these two is actually is bounded by the gap. So if we see the higher the gap is, the quicker the, our averaging operator converges in the operator norm to the averaging um, with respect to the Haar measure. So that's why we are interested in uh, in gap. So actually, if this gap exists, then we have optimal scaling. So log one over epsilon uh, length of words are uh, sufficient. And examples of such uh, sets are known, at least for d equal to um, with optimal, which are have this optimal the optimal gap because in fact this gap is bounded by some uh, function of just the cardinality of s, the so-called uh, Keston. It's a result of Keston. But the problem is that we cannot really calculate, it's very hard to calculate this gap because it, for that we need to analyze the spectrum of infinite dimensional operator. So uh, what we do is we uh, just restrict our operator to find the dimensional subspace. So we can do it in two ways, either uh, the way, the easy way, I mean, the straightforward way is to just bound the highest wave of presentations which, which we are using. And the second is to restrict to the weights of, uh, which correspond to T designs of, uh, or, or T moment operators. So uh, this is another second interesting concept, which also uh, um, explains the applications of and why we study GAP R. Um, the, so the t exact T designs are, are used in various areas, uh, which are here. But uh, also we can think of the approximate uh, T designs. So uh, something is approximate T design. So that's a subset of our group such that if we have if we, this uh, T moment operator here uh, is, is, is difference in operator norm from the hard average is smaller than one. So then we said it's a delta approximate T design. So actually one minus gap at scale T is the approximation level of, of the T design. So ideal t, an ideal T design is just something, a subset of our group, which has this property that we average over this, this subset, which is, for example, a finite subset. It's the same as averaging over the whole group. So that's very useful for uh, various benchmarking stuff, etc. Yes, so uh, the second way we can restrict T S is to uh, cor uh, the corresponding weights of the T uh, operator, and then we have gap T. And fortunately, if we, even if we know just this restricted gap, we have some information about the uh, efficiency. So we don't need to know the global gap. So we had two objectives, actually. The first objective was to find explicit bounds on gap T. And the second objective was to describe the distribution of gap T for hard random S. So what happens if we pick random quantum gates? What is the distri this? Well, this is some, uh, uh, this becomes some, uh, some um, variable probabilistic uh, and it has some 
distribution, expectation value, etc. So we can ask those questions. So uh, in terms of this objective, we published uh, one paper where we give explicit polylogarithmic lower bounds for generic S. Okay. So maybe if I still have five, then I will, uh, won't skip this slide. So what is the state of the art uh, in terms of bounding this gap? And so why we want to bound the gap from below? Because then we can say something about uh, the, this L here. Yes, so state of the art, at least up to my knowledge, is uh, this theorem of value that says that gap R can be bounded as follows. So there is the polylogarithmic bound. The problem with this bound is that those constants, especially R0, which is some scale required, uh, so it tells us that the vanishing of gap is lo uh, like, like one over logarithm to some power from point from some scale R0. So we need to know what is the gap up to this scale, and then we can say something about larger scales. The problem is that this R0 has been not provided. Uh, it's just the theorem just says that there exists some R0. Mm. So that's not really appealing. So what we try to do, we could try to get bounds which can be actually calculated. So we know all of these things, but it's worse, uh, but still polylogarithmic. Okay. So, uh, so in this paper, we gave such an example of explicit polylogarithmic lower bound for generic S and it's what's crucial with us is that it's computable on existing supercomputers, at least for qubits. Maybe it can be tried for two qubit gates. So here's the paper, it's in Jane uh, Fizet. In terms of objective two, so the distribution of gap R, there are two papers. So um, there is a paper, uh, matrix concentration inequalities, uh, where we, uh, there are bounds on the distribution of gap T for H random S. So this uh, answers the question, how many quantum gates are needed to form a delta approximate design with high probability? And there is some concentration of gap T uh, around the expectation value phenomena explained, like uh, more or less how it behaves in terms of this concentration around expectation value. And the last paper is uh, also about objective two where there is a proposition of a random matrix model describing gap T for H random S. And uh, there is also a numerically backed up conjecture about uh, that, which is, um, that the H random S have spectral gap with probability one, which is very, if proven, that would be really good result uh, because it's still unproven that the gap exists for any S. Um, um, universal S, but this is the conjecture that goes back many years, I think to the 60s or something. So that if, if we were able to prove this conjecture, that would almost uh, solve the Saranax conjecture. Uh, yeah, at least for a, a generic, like, I mean that would solve it for ability one, right? <laughs> um, Okay, and uh, the, sum the summary is that we, the description of spectral gaps is an interesting mathematical problem, but it also has relevant applications, quantum computing. So uh, there are um, two things, efficiency of universal self for quantum gates and properties of approximate T designs. We addressed two objectives. First was find explicit bounds on gap T, and second was to describe the distribution of gap T for randomness. And our work resulted in one paper and two preprints, and that's all, uh, thank you. Thank you, Oscar, for this uh, nice presentation. So, do do you have any questions to Oscar, maybe? Okay, so I would have one. So I got attracted by the statement that you made on one of your slides that uh, T-designs can be used for uh, entanglement detection. So can you, like, I know, outline how one does it? Detection of entanglement here. Unitarity designs. Well, just out of curiosity. Yeah, so... Uh Actually, I, I don't know the details. I just had, uh, like, uh, I, I know familiar with how it's used in randomized benchmarking, for example, okay. etc. And maybe uh, quantum information protocols. But this, I kind of found this statement in, um, when I was looking for more applications, but I didn't, know, I don't know the details, how it's actually used. In okay, thank you. So let's thank uh, Oscar again. Okay, so our next speaker is Mikołaj Korzyński, who will tell us about distance inequality. Okay, the stage is yours, Mikołaj. 
so this is the research uh, area of our topic. So we work uh, basically in applied general relativity. Uh, our group consists of two subgroup subgroups. My one uh, works most, mostly on cosmology and especially the drift effects. Also, more generally, uh, we work on light propagation in GR and also the role of inhomogeneities in cosmology. Uh, then Professor Kiyowski leads a subgroup working on mathematical relativity, mass and en energy problems, uh, gravitational radiation, and also alternative gravity theories. Uh, here is the structure of our uh, group. Uh, so there is me and Professor Kiyowski as, as the two senior people. Uh, then we have four PhD students, three of whom have actually completed their PhD thesis in, in 2022. Uh, and the fourth one, Julius Serbenta, is very likely to complete it very, very soon, next week, basically. Fortunately, we have a new uh, postdoc, Nezihe Uzun. Uh, so yeah, Nezihe is a new group member. Uh, she is a fellow of Polones Bees. Uh, she is originally from Turkey, but she completed her PhD in New Zealand, in Christchurch. Uh, under the supervision of David Wiltshire, then did her first postdoc in Prague, the second one in the group of Thomas Buchert in Lyon. Uh, we have currently two research projects. The first one is the one by Neziche, which started late last year. The title is Wavization and Quantization of the Observables in the Universe. And the idea is simply to study the uh, geometric optics in curved space-time uh, to identify various classical but also wave and quantum effects. The idea is to wavize and quantize the bundle of light rays uh, using basically symplectic structure and metaplectic transformations on phase space. On top of that we also have one Sonata Bis uh, project going on but it's also ending pretty soon within a couple of weeks. Uh, now the papers from this year. Uh, Professor Kiyowski and his first PhD student, uh, Katarzyna Senger, published a paper um, about the, uh, containing an interesting result about the equivalence of a very wide class of alternative gravity theories to the standard GR if we look at them through the lens of appropriate variables. That's an interesting result. I wonder how, how it will be received later by the community. And also another paper about the non-metricity of the connection arising naturally from the classical theory of gravity. Uh, the idea is that there is a special type of Palatini action principle called Palatini action from which people usually derive the uh, standard gravity theory, but it turns out that for very generic matter fields, not, not especially simple ones, you typically get a theory with a non-metric connection. But the paper I would like to talk mostly about today is the paper of myself and my PhD student Julius Serbenta testing the null energy condition with precise distance measurements. Uh, in this paper we prove a very special, uh, a special inequality. Uh, let me first begin how we arrived there at this result. So we were investigating the distance measures uh, using trigonometric parallax and angular size to an, of a known source in Schwarzschild spacetime. So there is many ways in which you can define the distance to a distant object. One of them is to compare its angular size on the sky with its physical cross-section, but you can also use the parallax effect. What happens, how, how it changes its position when you change your uh, when you change your position according to some kind of baseline. And a baseline averaged quantity uh, can be defined as, as d par. Well, earlier we managed to prove that at the leading order, the difference between these two is proportional to the amount of matter along the line of sight. Uh, but in the Schwarzschild spacetime, we notice that whatever we do, the parallax distance is always larger than the angular diameter distance up to uh, a singularity we see here, corresponding to something called the focal point. And this quantity mu, which measures the difference, remains always positive. And since this is universal, we thought that this might be generalized to a completely non-perturbative result. And indeed, this is true. So we managed to prove a theorem. We assume something called the null energy condition. This is a fairly common condition people impose on the Ricci tensor, and it's equivalent to a condition on the matter fields, that uh, the Ricci tensor contracted with any null vector is non-negative. 
And we also assume that between the observation point and the emission point in this situation, there are no optical singular points. I will not go into details what we mean, but basically we want to avoid things like focal points, so places where um, initially parallel rays uh, intersect. And then we can prove that the parallax distance has to be larger than the, or at least non-smaller than the angular diameter distance. And moreover, the equality happens if and only if there's effectively no uh, light experiences, no curvature along the way. To rephrase it in a less mathematical language, if this null energy condition holds, then both focusing of light by matter or tidal distortions, so there might be tidal fields which distort the light rays, makes the parallax distance larger with respect to the angular diameter distance, at least up to the first focal point. Why is this result interesting? Well, first let's begin with the null energy condition. That's one of the simplest pe conditions people started imposing on the curvature in general relativity. It translates to a condition on the stress energy tensor satisfied by any normal matter field in relativity. So people generally believe it is satisfied in our own universe. It's necessary for the standard GR, mathematical GR results such as singularity theorems. It may, however, fail in some modified gravity theories or with very exotic models of dark energy. Now, assume that we measure the parallax distances to a sample of uh, bodies which are at the same time standard candles or standard sirens or standard rulers. So we can have both, you can measure both the parallax distance and the angular diameter distance or luminosity distance and the redshift. And it turns out that we can express mu as a relative difference using this formula or that one. Now, the point is that any systematic observation of negative mu would be very difficult to reconcile with the GR as we know today. Uh, if you believe in light propagating along null geodesics and in the null energy condition, that cannot happen. And this is a fairly strong result. It assumes nothing about the space-time geometry at all. So previously, we, sh we have shown that the measurement of mu can be used to measure the amount of matter along the line of sight for short distances. But here we prove something um, is different, that even the sign of mu carries some physical significance. It carries information about whether the null energy condition holds or not. So this way we show a model independent test of null energy condition, plus, of course, light propagation on, over null geodesics. Uh, the fundamental problem is the same as with the previous measurement. This is a very small effect, and this is way below current measurements precision. So this is a result for the future um, astronomers, if, if ever. Uh, let me just point out that recently at least a couple of researchers thought about uh, results of this kind. So six years and then uh, derived in 2014 an interesting consistency test uh, of comparison of angular diameter distance and parallax distance for various redshifts is the test of homogeneity of expansion. And year before, Asta Heinezen proposed a model independent probe of the strong energy condition, a slightly different one, uh, using the redshift drifts, so the, the circular changes of redshifts of distant objects. So it fits very well into, this paper fits very well into this, uh, uh, this group of papers. Let me finish with a sketch of the proof, because I think it's very nice. Uh, so we've got this quantity which measures the fractional difference between the angular diameter distance and the parallax distance. Now, I won't show it here, but you can prove something very funny. If you shoot a, a bundle of light rays which are initially parallel to this connecting light ray, uh, if you follow it later and measure the cross-sectional area, then mu is basically equal to the ratio of the initial cross-sectional cross area at point lambda to the initial one. It's not trivial to see it, but it turns out to be true. Uh, but there is already in relativity a, a whole formalism for dealing with this problem. This cross-sectional area can be expressed as the initial one times integral of something called the expansion. Expansion is a quantity which measures how the light rays uh, diverge al uh, along each, each point. And it's known that this expansion satisfies certain ODE, called the Rajadori equation, uh, the funny fact about this equation is that if the null energy condition holds, the right-hand side is always negative. The initial theta is equal to zero. So, sorry. So we may easily see that theta has to be negative. So we can easily see that this exponent has to be lower than one. So we easily see that mu is positive. So we easily see that the angular diameter distance is smaller than the parallax distance. Uh, it's a surprisingly simple result when you look at it this way. Uh, yeah. 
And I think this would be it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikawai. There is a question. Go ahead. Thank you. It was really nice. Uh, I was wondering if you have considered doing some sort of forecast. Like you said that the precision right of the measurements is not enough to, to, to say this. But probably a, a question could be what precision we would we need in the future measurements of robots like uh, standard candles, sirens, etc., such as to achieve a mu detection of something. That would be a really nice uh, thing to, to ask. I wonder if you have done something or thought about we, it? We have done something, but it's not a full forecast. We just did uh, back on the envelope calculations. So within the galaxy, within the Milky Way, the furthest parallax ever measured was at the distance, I think, something like 20 kiloparsecs. And it was measured with around 10% precision. On the other hand, this difference within the galaxy is of the order of 10 to minus 4. So there is a, a pretty big gap here, and that's a, that, that's a problem. You need either a lot of sources for which you can do this measurement, or much more precise determination of position, and that's, that's the answer. Okay, any other question? Okay, so let's thank Mikola again. So now the speaker is uh, Krzysztof Pawłowski, our director, and he will tell us about soliton, solitons in quantum droplets. Okay. The stage Thanks for the quick introduction. First, I will present our statutory topic uh, group, topic quantum gases. I would say a very powerful community because we have acting director, the chair of the research council, who was also the former director for many years, and he transfers our institute from a very small unit to what we have now. Uh, the director of this topic is uh, Professor Zonjewski, who is also former director of CFT. Uh, Victor uh, joined us uh, once the war started in Ukraine. Then we have talented engineers who are my PhD students, Maciek Marciniak and uh, Jakub Kopaczyński. And Burat Uzemen is postdoc. We have also uh, student scholarship, Piotr Kulik and Piotr Grochowski. Uh, he finished his PhD, which was, by the way, awarded by the physical, uh, Polish Physical Society, as, uh, and, and he left to, uh, to Austria now. Uh, achievements. So concerning so big group, we, do, we haven't published many papers last year, just four of them, but they are interdisciplinary. There's also medicine here uh, by Kuba Kopaczyński. Uh, there were three other publications accepted last year who are, which are now published, including uh, physical review letters, which was actually a uh, topic of um, article in a Polish, academy, uh, in Polish press agency, Nauka w Polsce. Uh, concerning projects, we had four of them. One was just for popularizing uh, science, and this project for popularizing science was to build an uh, exhibition which would show what is the quantum cryptography. Uh, it was done mostly by Jacek Szczepkowski, but also uh, me and uh, Maciek and Kuba were building this and programming, and then we had workshops for schools. Uh, Kuba published uh, um, pub, uh, papers uh, popularizing science, including one in Lorient, in French. Uh, concerning projects, we have Sonata Bis for my group, Opus, led by Professor Zonjewski. Uh, Victor managed to, uh, to have his own project. He was awarded uh, Polones Bis, and then this project for outage I just mentioned. Uh, so let me jump to results. I decided to pick up like one achievement from uh, from all of these papers, although it's spanning, I think, for two or three papers. So imagine that we have a very simple system, just a box with moving atoms, okay? And then, this is like 19th century thermodynamics. Uh, and this simple system was subject of a paper of Albert Einstein, who was thinking about the system in the phase space, so we have elementary cells for position of momenta of different particles, and he found out, sorry, that if you count the number of atoms which are in this excited state, so with no zero momentum, higher momentum, then there is upper limit for the number of atoms that can be there. What means that if you add more and more atoms, keeping fixed temperature, however the temperature is high, then the subsequent atoms, they have to land in momentum P1, the lowest possible momentum. There will be more sure just. P equals zero. 
what means that you have number of atoms much larger than this critical number of atoms, almost all atoms will be motionless. And this phenomenon is known as both the Einstein condensate and uh, the number of condensed atoms and those statistics was very precisely measured recently by Jan Art. This is the group from Denmark with uh, which we are collaborating. And this is indeed the most precise measurement of the number of atoms inside the condensate. Such precise that you can also measure the fluctuation of this number. And this was the first such uh, measurement. Uh, okay, the achievement of Bose-Einstein condensate 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, uh, it started a lot of research in subfields. And one of the subfields was to reach Bose-Einstein condensate, so this motionless thing, <coughs> but with atoms that they have permanent magnetic moment, like chromium, dysprosium, erbium. And chromium was the, the first one. So we have to think about chromium atoms as small magnets, what means that if these dipoles of chromiums are in head to tail configuration, they will attract each other. If they are in this deconfiguration, so next to each other, they will just repel. And with this system, you can do a very funny experiment, which is known as Bosenova, in relation to supernova. So imagine that you have atoms polarized with this magnetic field B in this direction, but they are kept in such a tight trap that the atoms cannot reach this head to tail configuration. Because there is some potential, they cannot move freely along magnetic field. And imagine that suddenly you are changing this magnetic field quickly but adiabatically, such that these uh, dipole moments follow the direction of magnetic field. And then suddenly all of them are in head to tail configuration, what means they will attract each other, what means they will, the whole cloud will collapse. But once these atoms are uh, very close to each other, they will feel another forces coming from well, short range physics. And then they will quickly explode. So there's collapse and explosion, exactly like in a supernova, well, not exactly, but uh, similar. Uh, and then uh, in this field, it's possible to, well, to measure very precisely where the atoms are. In, you can also make a picture of this exploding cloud, which is here on the left. This is the result of Tillman Fau group. Uh, then you can compare it with the simulation, which is on the right, and you see it's matching. It's not a very typical explosion, because during a collapse and during explosion, the atoms feel this dipolar force. So they are not exploding isotropically. They're exploding like in, inside this p orbital, which is proportional to uh, dipolar interaction potential. <coughs> uh, the simulation for that is very simple, actually. Because if you, you assume that everything is in this Bose-Einstein condensate, it means that all atoms are occupying the same single orbital. And there is effective simple equation for this orbital. It's called gross pitayevsky equation. Uh, which is working, as you see, even for such an extreme situation of collapse and an explosion. Okay, so far so good, but then people managed to reach this uh, condensate of dysprosium. This is such a species that has a larger magnetic uh, moment. They were repeating this Bosonova experiment, but instead of this explosion, again, group of Tim and Fau observed in 2016 this. So, uh, the cloud shrinked and then it split into pieces and these pieces were stable and self-bound. And it was a big surprise in our community. So no one knew what was that. It was really unexpected. And in one year it was explained that there is new mechanism which we always ignored because it, usually it was a very weak effect. But here it is a very big effect which is called quantum stabilization. It's happening when so mild field forces, attraction and repulsion almost cancel each other. Then you have to look at the energy more closely, look for the further correction to the energy. And in this quantum corrections, you will see some stabilization mechanism. Uh, this new phase which appeared there is called now quantum droplet. It's indeed, uh, it has liquid properties. And then you need new equation to describe the system. So as you imagine, many groups are working still on this on these quantum droplets. Uh, actually, simple generalizations of this equation usually are quite effective. Uh, 
but they are phenomenological. So what we wanted to do, well, we wanted to study these quantum droplets, and to study them, we wanted to do some ab initio quantum calculation from one side, and from the other, uh, use another equation, another model, which would capture this quantum correction, something better than this mean field gross Pitayevsky equation. Uh, well, once we would like to do some uh, ab initio quantum calculation, we are forced to work in quasi 1D or 1D systems, because only then such calculations are possible. Uh, and then we propose this equation, which looks very similar to gross Pitayevsky. Well, it's to some extent is derived and benchmarked, uh, where there is some additional term, but this term has to be computed using uh, uh, many body calculations. In 1D for short range forces, there is exact solution of Lieb and Linegar from 63. For other system, you have to do quantum Monte Carlo, and how you have some new equation. Uh, more details is here, are here. To make the long story short, we have this equation. Well, I should maybe mention that this is not uh, totally like new and crazy. Uh, first of all, if the interactions are weak, this equation is the same as the equation which was uh, already used, but has this feature that you can use it uh, also for stronger interactions where this strength G is, is relatively large. And we found that uh, especially in the strong interacting limit, limit there, the droplets will appear also in quasi 1D system. This was our result from 2020. Uh, well, and then we generalized it to mixtures of uh, different bosons. And then we started to ask uh, the following, the, the follow-up questions, like whether is it possible that inside these droplets there will be like other interesting excitations. For instance, the solitonic excitations. These excitations are interesting to ask because this is well, they were well studied in experiment. There comes from nonlinearity. There are also important for mathematics. So we look at solitons. So what are solitons? In uh, our community, there are, we are speaking about two different kinds of solitons. Either there are bright solitons, which is just the peak of the density with constant phase, or uh, gray or dark solitons, gray or black solitons, which are dips in the density, which are moving without uh, okay, changing the shape, or they are very robust. Uh, in particular, the black soliton has the density inside equal to zero. And uh, if you look at the phase, uh, there is pi jump, so not continuous, uh, at this position where the density is t touching zero. Okay, so these are solitons, they were uh, well, well studied for Bose-Einstein condensate or inside Bose-Einstein condensates. And then there were, was the question whether such solitons can also appear in droplets and how different they would be as compared to these solitons in a, in a Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay, so we squeeze. So we have our equation, and uh, of course it can be solved numerically on many ways, but there is also some special limit in which you can do some analytical calculation. The limit is if the interaction strength is infinitely strong. This regime is achieved in experiments. It's not uh, a big deal, I would say. But also, when <coughs> uh, inside the typical scale for the uh, effective non-local interaction, there are many atoms if the prop is sufficiently dense. And in this special limit, one can, well, first of all, this equation uh, has a simple form. Then you can treat it analytically. And then we found analytically that uh, in this regime, you can expect solitons. That such objects exist inside droplets, but they can have a very different and unexpected features. So if the strength of the dipolar interaction, effective strength, you can be tuned this parameter also changing the gas density. So this is tunable. Uh, if it's getting larger, then the width of this solitons, I remind you that the solitons we are studying are these uh, dark solitons, and they have some width here. So it seems it, it's turned out that this width <coughs> is getting larger and larger 
once this effective dipolar interaction is stronger. It can be even infinitely large. There is some singularity. And then once you cross the singularity on the other side, there are still solitons, but even these motionless solitons are not black. So you can have solitons with the density not touching zero, which are not moving and are uh, robust, which was quite unexpected. So uh, to sum up this slide, you can have some new types of solitons, which are very wide. So in principle, maybe it would be easier to, uh, to watch them in experiment. And then they have very peculiar other properties, that they are not black, and because of that, actually, the phase is constant. So here is again, uh, this is, uh, these features are uh, very typical for black solitons. If you have uh, gray solitons, then they do not differ so much from, from their uh, counterparts in both the Einstein condensate. There is the movie, I don't know if it will work. Not really, uh, and time is running out. So I will just show this slide. Then we do some numerical calculation uh, to look maybe at uh, other regimes, not only this analytical extreme regime. So we here is uh, position, here is time. We started with a droplet, so it's real droplet. It's uh, it has flat top like a droplet on the table, and uh, some surface tension and edges, and it is possible at least in numerics to. Uh, generate soliton inside, which is this deep, which is moving with the speed we calculated before. Uh, it's robust as it should be, and it's uh, robust against collision with, with phonons there. So that's it. To sum up, I wanted to convince you, uh, first of all, that there is some new interesting system in our community, these are these droplets. And then we studied solitons inside these droplets. Uh, and we have shown that these, drop, these solitons can be ultra white, and because of that, it was accepted uh, like something new and interesting in a physical review letters. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Krzysztof, for this nice presentation. Ah, there is a question by Wojciech. Thanks, for me. <coughs> Thanks Krzysztof, very nice activity of the whole group. Uh, although. Can you maybe quickly comment uh, for me? Because you said we propose this equation, so I got this feeling that it's, is this then an ansatz, or this is actually something you you derive from first principles that includes all the physics you think is relevant, or you just ignore something and that's why it's a simplified version. I'm not probably so complicated, but could you quickly comment to I me? I would say that this is derivation with many simplifications. So we started with hydrodynamics. We had the results for the exact results for the pressure coming from short range forces used this pressure in hydrodynamics, but then we had problem with this uh, non-local part, which we had to assume that this is weak perturbation. And summing up, we are this, we ended in this equation. Well, it performs quite well. It seems so, yes. <laughs> well, it has some limitations. Uh, okay, we have another question by Professor Turski. I have a simple question. Are those droplets stable? Yes, yes. So they were generated in the but experiments in trap system. Are they stable system. with respect to the oscillations of uh, their shape? Uh, yes, also. They, it was also studied that the For arbitrary uh, angular momentum deformation, I mean... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> that, would be, that would be the only droplet existing in the universe which is stable with... No, 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 no. When you start rotating, finally it will break up. No, no, not rotating. If you have a mm -hmm. if you have a droplet and you pinch it, the shape changes. Mm -hmm. and the the compose the shape changes in the Legendre polynomials, and they depend on the angular momentum. And all possible droplets known in physics are eventually unstable with respect to. That's the f I mean, phenomenon which is called the Mullins-Sekerka instability. So the the question is how is how they are shape dependent oscillation stable for those droplets? First, I should maybe mention that uh, these droplets, they, they have still sh relatively short uh, lifetime, like 50 milliseconds, but during its lifetime, because of three body losses. They are so dense that 
in such temperatures yeah, the atoms I, I, are meeting. I understand, and I mean, but the, 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 this, these instabilities are also time dependent. In, in that, I, uh, so okay. I would say Perhaps that maybe it wasn't observed. Uh, the question is for sure good. It was studied experimentally, but uh, um, I don't know whether this instability was observed. It can be that it was omitted. But okay, I propose to move this discussion to the so coffee break. <laughs> So I again propose to move this discussion to the coffee break. And let's thank Krzysiek again. <coughs>
means from which direction you are looking at the source. So if you are looking at along this uh, symmetry axis, or you can say the perpendicular to the accretion disk, then these are called quasars. And here I will talk about the radio quiet quasars, this one. Now next point is what is reverberation mapping? Now since uh, these agents are very at very large distances, even the nearest agent cannot be resolved with the present presently available instruments. So to understand the physics, what is uh, at the uh, at the close at the uh, close to the, this supermassive black hole, we need some different techniques. So reverberation mapping is one such technique. In this technique, we see. Uh, the continuum emission, which is coming from this uh, accretion disk, and then there is uh, there is a light coming from the um, blot line regions, and this light is coming after some time lag. So if we measure this time lag, we multiply it with the uh, speed of velocity, we can we can get the size of the BLR. Now, what is uh, wavelength resolved reverberation mapping? Uh, in standard reverberation mapping, we find the time lag between the continuum and the any emission line. But in wavelength resolved reverberation mapping, we divide the spectrum in different different wavelength bins and then find the time lag between those uh, light curve in those wavelength bins and the and the continuum emission. I will be uh, talking about more with uh, on this wavelength resolved reverberation mapping in my coming slides. So uh, what are the important results we can get from the reverberation mapping? First one is the uh, mass of the black hole. The black hole mass is very important to understand the link between the black hole and the host galaxy. So uh, here this term uh, within these brackets is called uh, virial function. And you know this, this tau is the uh, time lag that we measure from the reverberation mapping. And this delta v is the line width of the emission line. So these two uh, quantities we can get from the observations. And this f is, the, is, a const, is a constant, which is of the order of unity. And it depends on the geometry of the BLR. So if we know these two terms, this tau, uh, time lag, and delta v, we can get the mass of the black hole. So another important uh, result is uh, from the reversal mapping is the radial luminosity relation. So uh, in general, this, uh, the radius of the BLR is proportional to the, it, to the luminosity of the quasars. And theoretically, the value of alpha is around 0.5. And observationally, people have found the same results. It's alpha is around 0.5. And this is from uh, using the edge beta line reverberation mapping. But this edge beta is uh, for the low redshift agents. When you go to the higher redshift, you cannot see the edge beta in the optical part. It goes to the IR. So for high, for high red shift AGN, people have used uh, MG2 lines or C4 lines to, uh, to get this uh, radius luminosity lesson. Let's come to uh, the, our work. So we have observed this quasar, CTSC 30.10, which is a br bright quasar with V band magnitude around 17.2 at a high red shift, that is close to one. So we observed this blazer using the Southern uh, African Telescope for nine, for nine years, uh, to, for a total of 35, uh, 36 occasions. And photometric observations uh, we have taken from various telescopes. Uh, so here is a uh, sample spectra um, in the rest frame. So uh, we first model this spectra uh, using the template. And then we find uh, this, is this, uh, this one is the MG2 line, the first component. This is the second component of MG2 line. And this is the FE2 line, the first component. And this small one is the FE2 second component. So uh, we follow here the two, uh, OK. Yeah, so here we follow the uh, reverberation mapping in two ways. First, the standard way, we compare the, um, the line emission with the continuum. And the second one is the we, we, we resolve the spectrum and then compare the each wavelength uh, light curve with the continuum. So for, uh, 
for the standard way, we fitted the, uh, the spectrum. And then uh, we subtracted here. This, this uh, green one is the power law continuum. And to get the flux of mg2, we subtracted the power law and the Fe2 line. And to get the uh, Fe2 flux, we subtracted the power law and mg2 line. And for wavelength resolved thing, we estimated the uh, RMS spectra and divide the entire uh, spectra into seven wavelength bins, having equal amount equal amount of flux. So here, uh, you can, here is the the top panel is the continuum light curve, and the second one is the uh, MG2 light curve, total MG2 light curve, and the third panel is the Fe2 light curves. And then we compare, uh, then we correlate these light curves and find the time lag using these many uh, different methods. So the mean uh, time delay in the rest frame is uh, 276 days for MG2 line and 270 days uh, for Fe2 lines. We found two time lags uh, for Fe2. One is 270 days and one is 180 days. So now what, uh, so uh, the rest frame time lags for MG2 and Fe2 are 276 and 270 days, which is uh, almost equal, so the mean distance of these uh, emission regions are around 0.23 parsecs. Then this second time lag, uh, which is a uh, shorter time lag, which is one around 180 days for Fe2 lines, it, is, it could be because of the extended part of the Fe2, which is closer to the observer. So this emission from this region is coming earlier. So that's why we are getting a shorter time scale. And now this is the <coughs> wavelength resolved time lag, uh, uh, reverberation mapping. These are, uh, the first panel is the, again, the continuum light curve. And these seven panels are the uh, light curves for those seven wavelength bins. And then uh, we f again find the time lags using different, different methods. I'll skip this one. And okay, here, here is the uh, interesting thing. So here we have plotted uh, the time delay with the wavelengths. In the first panel is the mean spectra, here in the model RMS spectra, in, and in the bottom is, is the observed RMS spectra. And we have found that for the, um, this is the, this MG2 components, the time lags is around same. So it means that there are no, the MG2 com component is not coming from the two different regions because there is no time delay. Because there is no difference between time delays. And uh, another important result is that we did not find any, uh, any consistent pattern of the time delay with the wavelengths. So, okay, and the next point is we have uh, drive the UV Fe2 uh, radio luminosity relation. So before this study, there is only one uh, source, which is a Seifert galaxy, NGC 5548, uh, for which uh, UV Fe2 time lag is found. But uh, we have found for the another source, which is CTS 3C30.10, the time delay, uh, UV Fe2 time delay, so we can we can estimate, we can drive the uh, radial luminosity relation for uh, Fe2 line here. And we, when we fitted it, uh, we found that the, uh, this alpha is around 0.5, which is the standard value. So this is the first time uh, this radial luminosity relation is found for using the uh, UV Fe2 line. And here is the update. We have added two more, we have added two more sources in this, uh, in this plot. See these two sources, and now the result is uh, much better with the dispersion is uh, around 0.12, and again the alpha is close to 0.5. So this work is uh, ready for submission. Okay, so I'll uh, leave here with this takeaway message. Thank you. So thank you, Ashwani, for your nice presentation. So we have time for one quick question. Thank you. Uh, I'm surprised that there was only one source for many years, and now this group has added many new ones in this flux in this luminosity diagram. So I'm just curious about what was new, uh, what happened there. Okay. Uh, actually, Thank uh, you. Uh, actually, the problem is uh, these UV Fe2 lines are very rare, and these are mostly found in the high redshift quasars. Um, so that's why people have detected only for this uh, NGC 55. 40, yes. 
And also to detect this, uh, we need very high quality spectra. So that's, yeah. Okay, let's thank Ashwani uh, again and all the speakers of the first part of our session. And now I'd like to invite you to the uh, outside of the auditory to, for, the, for the coffee break. And I would like to ask you to be back here at 11.30, okay? We, s we have to stand the, the other part of the session. Okay, so let's start the second session uh, of our annual reporting session. And the first talk will be given by Professor Łukasz Turski to be about science and culture. This is the report on the topic of our research, which is called the science and society. And I decided to pick up a part of it, uh, which was a lecture given for the P PhD students uh, of our uh, PhD schools. And uh, as far as I know, that was the first lecture like that, at least in Warsaw and most probably uh, in the country as well. And uh, I pick up a particular part of that lecture, but before we see why, let me show you a, a short plan what was included in those lectures. And um, this is a review of the, how science influence culture and art since, roughly speaking, uh, a half of the 19th century until the beginning of the digital era. And until the beginning of the 20th century, the most read book in the, our world literature was the book written by a Greek slave in Egypt, Euclid, Euclid, under the name of Elements. And the important change in the role the Euclidic elements played in the history of our civilization was the 1854 when Bernard Riemann published his uh, habilitation paper. Uh, this is the title of it, Über die Hypothesen, welche die Geometrie zugrunde legen. And that was a revolution, not only in mathematics, where it turns out that the geometry might be different than described in the Euclid elements, but also that there might be a different kind of a three-dimensional geometry, which we now call the non-Euclidean geometry, but also there might be a many-dimension geometry. And that was the intellectual shock for the educated part of the society. And since about the mid of the 19th century, the discussion about the more-dimension geometry becomes a topic for the parties between educated part of the society of the world. And uh, many books have been written about for a so-called common people about the geometry. And let me show you one of them. This is a book written by the Church of England clergyman, Mr. Abbott, who was writing under the name S. Square, uh, who wrote a book, uh, Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. This is the very interesting book about the two-dimensional world. And uh, if you will be keen to see it, you can go to the Copernicus Science Center and our robotic theater play a play based on that book. Uh, robots play the book of the flat 
romance of many dimensions. But there were more serious books about the geometry, and one of them is the book by a certain gentleman, Charles Hinton. Hinton was the English professor of mathematics who uh, was a bigamist and uh, escaped from England to the United States, becomes a professor of mathematics at Princeton University. Uh, there he was arrested for the improper use of the department money, and uh, uh, he wrote a books the, on the four-dimension geometry, but finally he made the money by building up, use until today, machine for uh, training the pitchers in baseball, and uh, uh, but he had invented a notion which is called the tesseract. Tesseract is a word to describe a four-dimension hypercube, and it is very difficult to and to draw the four-dimension cube. I mean, any object in a four-dimension world. But since time of Hinton, we are describing a four-dimension geometry by plotting two-dimension projections of uh, three-dimension surfaces of the four-dimension objects. And that is a little graphics which tells you how it looks like. And we have a simple cube, and we can see in our mind all the properties of a four-dimension, of a three-dimension cube by looking at the a grid of a surface of a three-dimension cube. And that allows us to envisage the properties of a cube entirely. What you see here is a two-dimension projection of a three-dimension wall of a four-dimension cube. This is what is called the tesseract. And uh, this is an object which plays a role in art. This, what you see here, is a painting by Salvador Dali called Hypercube. You can see it in Metropolitan Museum in New York. And uh, next to it is a picture of a Salvador by itself. Uh, preparing for this presentation, I would like, I had actually a trailer of a movie, Cube, Hypercube, movie directed by the Polish uh, filmmaker, Andrzej, uh, who, uh, who had been uh, a cameraman for Quentin Tarantino, but uh, unfortunately my license for that film expired a few days ago, and uh, uh, I didn't manage to have it before. But it, there is even a movie about the hypercube. And that was a, a part of a, how the science penetrated the art. But the most important element of it happened in that little shack, which is the original paint photograph from 1910 from Montmartre in Paris. That is a, a shack which was a seat of an artistic commune called La Betola Voir. And uh, this uh, was a commune. Uh, uh, OK, that was a commune in which, which was run by the Guillaume Apollinaire, one of the famous French poets. And one of the members of the commune was a young Spanish painter, painter Pablo Picasso. And uh, turns out that Picasso uh, used the services of a lady who posed to his pictures. 
And that lady was a lady's partner of a French mathematician, Princet, who had become known as a mathematician of uh, cubies. At that time, there was an uh, interest, as I said, still of the four-dimension geometry. Uh, and a French engineer, Jouffre, had published a book on the four-dimension geometry. What you see on the left side of the picture is, the, is a two-dimension projections of the walls of the four-dimension icosahedron, one of the platonic bodies. And uh, Prince said, spent a lot of time in the commune at Montmartre, and he was telling Picasso about the four-dimension geometry. And what you see on the right is the picture which is considered by the historian of art as the beginning of a cubis, a direction in art which dominated the 20th century, not only paintings, but also the other branches of culture. And this is the famous mademoiselles from Avignon. And if you look at the face of so-called kneeling mademoiselle and on those little pieces that are the copies of a parts of the drawing of Jouffre. So that was, a, it's a, just a piece of what was in the lectures. The Mathematics have penetrated literature. Even Joseph Conrad published a detective story called Inheritors, where the villain in the book are the citizens of the four dimensions who had come. And uh, that was the, just the element of the lecture of how the science penetrate uh, culture, literature, paintings, and the film, and so forth. Uh, so I think that is just the, what I would like to tell you, and thanks for your patience. Just, we just on time, so thank you. Are there some questions? I think. Uh, uh, Who made this movie about the uh, cube superstar? I haven't heard it. Who made this movie? Andrzej Sekuła. Ah. Andrzej Sekuła is a direct uh, cameraman or, or talent in uh, Cubes. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, the. Someone is interested on the 8th of May, at the one of the cable televisions in Warsaw, I can give you a, a details, is going to show that, mm -hmm. that film. The film isn't particularly interesting as a film, but uh, the <coughs> uh, shows of the events in the four dimensional cube in the film is is something which is pretty impressive. And yeah. the lecture is recorded, yes. The, the, your lecture is recorded and uh, available. Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. I think we, we have to, to <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe we shift it for... It's somewhere recorded in the universe, but <laughs> uh, the, the, the Zoom that berserk and I have not been able to locate it in where it is located. Okay. But I have my own recording. And there might be a book about it. So uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and I will invite uh, Katya here. Okay, so thank you. Um,
I will report today on the on the task um, on Carton geometries and special contact geometries. I think that's how it's called. Um, so let me first introduce the research group. So our the, the head of the group is um, Pavel Norovsky. Then we have a three postdocs, so um, Jarek Kopinski, Omid Makmali, and me. And then there's also, I also mentioned, we also have a, an undergraduate student who um, became interested and started to work with us a little bit. Um, now, the, our, most of our research is part of, of the Greek grant um, that we carry out together with um, the university, the Arctic University in Tromso. And um, I would say the, the research basically contains, can be divided into two groups. So one main theme are Cartan geometries, um, in, in, in particular geometries with symmetries, um, classification results of such um, geometries or structural results using a lot of um, also Lie theory. And then there's a, there's a part that's mostly sort of Lorentzian or conformal geometry and is more motivated also by, by actual applications in general relativity or also, um, yeah, for example, Penrose's cyclic cosmology and things like this. Um, so that's, that's roughly what, what we are doing. Um, the main, our main sort of meeting is, the, is an online seminar that we, that we carry out together with our Norwegian collaborators, which is online. And I also want to mention, so we've, we, for, for example, last year co-organized a small workshop also with um, collaborators in Japan. Now, very briefly, the, the, the articles that we've published last year, actually some of them are published early this year. And again, so the, the, the first three of these are mostly concerned with geometric structures, and um, sort of the symmetries or, or classification results, like the second one. And then the, the last three are sort of con conformal differential geometry and applications to, to GR. And, and so the ma main person here is, is actually Jarek Kopinski this in, in, during the last year who was carrying out this line of research. Um, but the, the published papers, we also have a few preprints. And what, what I want to speak about today is the very last um, preprint here. So the, the work I've been doing during the last year or, or one and a half years with Omid. So that's called, so the title is Parabolic Quasi-Contact Cone Structures with an Infinitesimal Symmetry. And so uh, let me start by introducing the geometries that we are looking at and actually that we are looking at more general. In, in, in most of our research. So definitely the, one of the main structures are conformal structures, which means we have a, we have a, a metric, say a, a space-time, but only defined up to scale. So um, an equivalence class of, of metrics. Uh, a sim an infinitesimal symmetry in this case would be a conformal killing field. So a, a vector field that whose local flow preserves the, the metric up to scale. Um, or equ equivalently, it would be a solution to the conformal killing equation. Now, for, for, for a conformal structure, generically, if you have a conformal structure, of course, that it will have no symmetries. But lots of interesting, the, the interesting geometries that we study do have symmetries. Another thing is that of the, 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 the symmetry, the, so it, the solution space will al always be finite dimensional, and one knows that the maximal symmetry uh, Lie algebra one can get is actually the, the special orthogonal group um, SOP plus one Q plus one. Um, so that, that's conformal structures. Now, all of the other structures that we study behave in many ways very similarly, and then another very popular one is the geometry of two, three, five distributions. So here the, the, the geometric structure is given by a sub-bundle in the tangent bundle of a five manifold that is not integrable. So, so Lie brackets of sections will not be contained in the, in the, in the distribution again. But, uh, but contrary, 
by taking Lee brackets, you generate the entire tangent bundle and as quickly as possible. So, um, and so these are called 235 distributions. Locally, they can always represent it by, um, as a kernel of 3 1 forms um, like this. And here now, an, an infinitesimal symmetry would be a vector field that preserves. Of whose local flow or the lead, via the lead derivative preserves the distribution. And here, again, the, the situation is very similar. I mean, in general, you, you will have no symmetries, but you will, again, one has a maximally symmetric model, which, which um, actually uh, is the symmetry group of the, of the Hilbert Carton equation that I wrote down here. So, so your f takes a very special form. And it turns out that the, the symmetry algebra in this case is the exceptional Lie group G2. Uh, which is maybe also one of the, the reason the geometry is sort of popular. But there, there are many other geometries of this type. And um, now let me say a few words about the paper that I wanted to look at. So we, we consider now, on the one hand, pseudo-Riemannian pseudo conformal structures, so for example, a Laurentian structure. Um, but the, the construction is actually quite general and works also for certain types of distributions in a very uniform way. And so if you have a, so in particular maybe it's important, so if you have a conformal structure, then one of, so what you keep as a, so you, if you think of it as a geometry, you sort of forget about distance, but you, you still keep the, the causal structure. You, you still, the, 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 the structure of light cones will be preserved. Uh, yeah. Oh. Okay, so I'm, I'm quick. Okay, so maybe the, the technicalities are anyway not so important. So now the point is that we now assume that our, our, our structure has a symmetry, so we fix a symmetry, and then we reduced. So first we we have a way of lifting our structure and then reducing the structure, so doing some kind of symmetry reduction, and then we get the. Uh, this gives us a correspondence between the structures we started with and certain geometries of variational ODEs. Um, the, the inverse construction is, is something that we refer to as quasi-contactification because it's very similar. So the, the entire construction is very similar to sort of relating a, sym a symplectic structure to a conform uh, contact structure. And I, I, at the very end, maybe I want to say that that's what we what we looked at is a class of geometries that's interesting in particular because it includes conformal structures and we should maybe also look more into details there. But of course, it can be generalized. And for example, Pavel Nurovsky has also a paper where he looks at even more general um, notions of contactifications, um, where he, which he, where via contactifications, he um, gets to the Lie algebra, to exe other exceptional Lie algebras. OK, so maybe I will stop here. Okay. Well, maybe there are questions. I can, I can, I can more. Okay. So then I can can go more into the detail how the construction works. Katia, could you switch to the first slide with the list of uh, publications? The paper in Automatica. What is that, that? Sounds like a very practical application of math. What was it about? <laughs> I mean, at least the title of the journal looks very more practical, like automation, <laughs> control theory, or something like that. Well, it's it's about it's. <laughs> Okay, so I, I don't remember, but it's a, it's a mechanical realization or a realization of a 235 distribution and the 36 distribution that Pavel gives. And I think he talked about this here once. So I don't remember any more pre the precise rules. But it's about snakes? No, it's about ants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ants are very different than snakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as we already entered the question part, uh, are there any questions? Okay, so it's not very good. Yeah, I could have. Well, we have a lot of natural ones, no? <laughs> No, but it's. For sure. Oh, he calls them ants, but you could call them anything else. I, I, I don't think that 
that anything has been constructed, but... Okay, so maybe a question. Uh, can I... No. <laughs> Katya, what is 235 distribution? 235 distribution, um, that, that 235 refers to the growth vector. So uh, can, you, can, can you show maybe the slide where, where it appeared? Um, yeah, I didn't. Thank you. Uh, here. So it appears, so, okay, so I take a, a non integrable rank 2 distribution locally, just two vectors, spanned by two vector fields. And now I take the Lie bracket of these two vector fields. Then I would get a third vector field that's pointwise linearly independent. So in, in total, I have now three vector fields. That's the three. I start with two, I get three. And now I take one small Lie bracket with sections of the distribution, and I get two more independent vector fields. So I get five. And that's what's called the growth vector, or the, the, the small growth vector. So if you, you continuously bracket with sections of your distribution, and you see what the rank is of the so you get, in this case, you, yeah, of the, oh. and that's how you, yeah, in, yeah, that's, that's why they're called 235 distributions. And what are the applications to general relativity? Because there are I think about that, that, so for example, what, so I think what Jarek looked at, for example, in, uh, in what, what? I think that, for example, in this, in this, I don't know precisely what the, but in this paper with with Gover is he looked at um, space times with positive positive cosmological constant and their mm -hmm. conformal infinity mm -hmm. and sort of uh, I don't know, a kind of a partial ca maybe characterization of those. Um, I don't know precisely. Okay, it's, yeah. it, it's not your topic. I, I no, no, but I mean, like, yeah, so, um, yeah. Maybe uh, you can discuss uh, later then, because <laughs> then I think we should move to the okay. next speaker. Uh, so thank you, Katya. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> and now there'll be talk of of Professor Augusiak, the Deputy Director for Science. So hello again. Uh, so my task is uh, called Non-Classical Correlations in Composite Quantum Systems, and uh, in my talk I would uh, try to, to show you uh, our the, the progress that we made in 2022 about semi-device independent certification. But before that I will start from, uh, from the group, from the quantum information group that I lead here uh, at the Institute. So last year we, we had uh, five postdocs, so like not for the whole year, but like at the beginning there were three, but like at, at the end there were five. Three of them were at the left. So now we are we have two postdocs, uh, Sazim and Alex. Sazim came with his own uh, scholarship distributed by Polish Academy of Sciences uh, within the Kofund Marikiri Kofund uh, program. So this, this was uh, quite nice that he got it. Then we had three PhD students, Shubhayan, Rafael, and Ovidio. Uh, Shubhayan defended his thesis at the beginning of this year, uh, which was uh, very nice. And hopefully Rafael will uh, submit his thesis this year, if everything goes well. And then there are five students that are associated to the group <coughs> that uh, show up unexpe unexpectedly at the institute and ask questions. And with some of them we have, uh, we have some projects that are less or more or less uh, successful and uh, might lead to some, some publications, which is uh, very nice. Uh, the main topics uh, of our group is characterization and detection of various forms of non-classicality in quantum systems, such as, for instance, quantum entanglement. Uh, I grew with quantum entanglement, let's say, and now I like work mostly with well known locality, but we also study quantum steering and quantum contextuality. But the other topic is to apply those, all those notions to design methods that al uh, would allow us to certify uh, quantum resources, let's say. For instance, quantum states or quantum measurements. And these are the projects that uh, finance our activities. The first two are like postdoctoral uh, projects, Pacific Area Dimensions. So Natina was, was given to Jakub, who was in our group last year, and he left uh, at the beginning of this year. 
And also we have a, a larger grants like Sonata Bis and Quantera. Quantera uh, is uh, very nice because it's like collaborative uh, European project with many institutes. But it's, it's sound, it's, it seems it's not so uh, easy to handle this, this, this project. There, there are many problems with that. Okay, and this is, this is our uh, output in terms of publications. So the first, uh, the first five are about certification. This one is about uh, characterization of entanglement in many body quantum systems. This one is about quantum networks, which is, uh, let's say, a new line of research in our group. And this one is about Bell non-locality. And this will make a huge part of, of Rafael's uh, PhD thesis, hopefully. And I'm going to talk about this too, plus some new results that we obtained last year. Uh, that concerns certification in the semi-device independent way, in which we can make some assumptions about the considered systems. Okay, so this is the title. So usually I start my uh, presentations with a, with a Bell scenario, where we have two parties, A and B, that share some quantum state, rho AB. The state might be uh, separable or entangled, doesn't matter at the moment. And then we, each of the parties can perform two measurements, and each measurement can have two outcomes, plus minus one. Okay, so like independently, each party performs a, so a state is distributed to A and B, and then each party performs a measurement, one of, one of these two, A0, A1, or B0, B1. And then the, the correlations that they observe are encoded into this uh, expectation values, AX, B, BY. And now, if they are able to violate uh, Bell inequalities, like this one, this, this is the most basic one, most studied one, the CHSH Bell inequality, and then we say that they observe Bell non-locality which means that they observe certain correlations that cannot be reproduced by classical means. Okay, and so now our aim is to use this Bell locality, Bell locality for certain purposes. And one of this is, is certification of quantum systems. So what's, what's the idea of this certification? So imagine that we have the same experiment as before, but now we don't know anything about the measurements that are performed by Alice and Bob, and we don't know anything about the state that, that is shared by, by them. Okay, so it's like, we don't know anything. What, what we know is the, uh, are the probability distributions or this expectation values. I mean, you, it's one-to-one -one correspondence, so I mean, you can use this representation on the other one, doesn't matter. So by knowing this uh, expectation, uh, this uh, probability distributions, we would like to say something about the, the both devices, the, the measuring devices, uh, as well as the state. And of course, if you would like to say something detect some quantumness in, in the system, you need to observe uh, non Bell non-locality. And this is nice because we don't need to make any assumptions about the devices. So we, we just rely on what the devices give us. So we ask questions to the devices that are encoded in X and Y. We receive some answers to that questions. And now based on this, we try to say something about these devices. And here, I, uh, here is the, the most famous example of the CHSH Bell inequality. If you violate it maximally, which means that like the, this expression takes the value two square root of two, which is the most known value in quantum information theory, then you're able to say that the, that the state that was shared by Alice and Bob must be of this form, up to certain equivalences, and the measurements that Alice and Bob perform mu must be also uh, of, of this form. So th these are just Pauli matrices and combinations of Pauli matrices. So you are kind of able to almost completely characterize the underlying system without knowing it. So you just take these numbers from, from the experiment and you are able to say something about uh, what's happening in the devices and what's, uh, what's the state shared by Alice and Bob. But you need to know distribution as well, right? Yeah, you, you measure, you get statistics, and from that statistics you can say something about the, the quantum system. So you, it's not that you know the... I mean, theoretically on paper you have to know it, but like in the experiment you don't have to. Uh, so now the task that we are trying to address in our group is to like apply this way of thinking into more complicated systems, higher dimensional systems, multipartite states, and to quantum measurements. And we want to uh, design methods that are experimentally friendly, so they don't use much resources, let's say. So they don't use many measurements, like the minimal number of measurements or the minimal or measurements with minimal number of outcomes and have uh, high robustness to, to noises and experimental imperfections. And this is, uh, well, this is difficult, as we already noticed in the group, that uh, to, to derive this type of like 
uh, certification methods is, is a hard task from the mathematical point of view. Also because we don't know methods. There are no methods to, to do that. So people, I have a collaborator who, who calls these methods ad hoc. So for each separate problem, we have to develop a new method. There are no general methods. So one of the uh, way out, uh, ways out is to consider certain relaxations of the device independent scenario where we don't assume anything. And one of such relaxation is, is this one. So we go back to the, to the best scenario, but now we assume that one of the parties perform measurements that are known. So for instance, Alice has a well-characterized measuring device. Mm -hmm. I'm almost uh, finishing. So uh, that performs, for instance, this measurements. Sigma X and sigma Z, uh, sigma Z. And now the task is the same. We would like to characterize the, the mm, measuring device of Bob as well as the s state shared by both parties. And of course, like we make this assumption but we hope that we can gain a lot by, by making this assumption. So we can derive certification methods for systems for which we cannot derive them in, in the device independent scenario. And the, the basic uh, resource that is used here in the semi-device independent scenario is uh, quantum steering that has been uh, studied uh, thoroughly in the literature, but the uh, certification methods based on quantum steering are not so known and not so well explored. So this was uh, our niche that we wanted to, to explore. So last year we published two, uh, two papers. Okay, this one was published last, uh, this year, but like at the beginning of this year, but it was like developed last year. So in this paper, we provided a method of certification of, of, me of, uh, of incompatible measurements, of any set of incompatible measurements on the untrusted side, on this side where we don't know what are the measurements. And in this paper, we developed a method to certify any pure entangled state shared by Alice and Bob. Here, so, well, a state of this form. Any pure entangled state can be brought to this form. Plus, the optimal amount of randomness. So if one wants to certify that the, the measurement, the quantum measurement gives rise to, to true randomness, we, you, you can use uh, our approach. And we also tried to, uh, to apply this way of reasoning to the multi scenario. So now we have like many observers here, you have three of them, and one of them uh, is, uh, is assumed to have a, a trusted measuring device. So it measures the, for instance, Pauli matrices or the generalization to uh, d-dimensional systems. And so far we have managed to, to provide certification methods for, for some known classes of, of quantum states like the multi qubit Schmidt states or the graph states that are known from the quantum error correction. And we, well, we hope that we could get such a method for basically any entangled three qubit state. But this, this is sti still under uh, construction. This, this, uh, so it's, it seems that the, this type of methods are very difficult to derive and uh, it's unclear how to even do that. So uh, yeah, we were facing many problems there. Okay, thank you, and uh, I would like to uh, ask you to approach uh, the members of my group, Alex, Boaje, Ovidius, and Sazim, to see their uh, posters during the poster session. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? There is a question of, uh, two questions. Uh, I think Jarek was the first one. Uh, Remig, you mentioned that uh, you face uh, the lack of methods. Uh, is there group theory somehow entering at the maximum violation, for example, like some, some sort of uh, discrete symmetries? Is that like a right intuition or not really? Well, so the, the, uh, the symmetries that you have here is that, for instance, this statement is up to uh, all local unitary operations. So it's, it's like taken into account already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is but this is like a local local base rotation, which is yes. sort of like gauged out. But uh, like this particular type of uh, observables, which give the the maximum violation. So can it be somehow understood using discrete group, like this discrete Heisenberg vial group, for example? Yeah, exactly. So th these are like okay. so th this. I mean, so. I'm telling you that you certify X and Z, but in principle you certify any two measurements that are mutually biased. So they are like from the veil heisenberg group. So in fact, we, we were trying to, to generalize this statement for higher dimensional systems where we could certify veil heisenberg operators because if we could do that, then we could certify uh, 
um, the optimal amount of randomness that is ge being generated uh, when when you perform a, a measurement on a quantum s entangled quantum system. And this is an apple, apple. Yeah, we are still working with it. So this is very difficult. We can discuss that later if you want. So, Remik, thank you very much for your presentation. I especially appreciate you, X for that you made it in a way that was digestible but many people like for example hopefully i understood something being outside of field although i will have very naive questions so probably for you it will uh, will sound naive but uh, please please bear in mind that it's not my field of study so you you say it's uh, i understand this is very far away from any uh, practical applications yet maybe well it's it's, it's still theoretical work but you use the, the the word certification of quantum device. Do you want to certify that actually there was a proper entanglement state generated, or do you want to certify there's a trusted agent? So in principle, in future, I can log into my bank using this certification, and the bank will know I'm me instead of standard uh, mesh encrypting method we use nowadays. Uh, thank you for that question. It was very nice. So this this way of uh, of certifying came from uh, quantum cryptography. So if you have two parties that would like to know whether if they uh, generate the bits, like by measuring quantum particles, whether these this bits are uh, secure. And to do that, they can first certify that the state that they share is this maximally entangled state. Once they know it, they know that the bits are uh, perfectly secure and perfectly correlated as well. So, so like both. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so let's move to the next speaker. So, honey. Ah, yes, sorry. So now that we talk of Suhani Gupta. So, hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Suhani. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the Institute. And today I will be representing our computational cosmology group here at CFT. Uh, presently, we are 11 members. We have two group leaders, uh, three postdocs, five uh, PhD students, and one project student. Uh, these are the highlights of 2022. We had over 34 pu published uh, articles. This also includes uh, large collaboration papers. And we have uh, six under review. Our group actively participated in many seminars, talks, conferences, workshops, both within and outside Poland. We also developed some uh, public codes, which, uh, some numerical codes, which are public and freely available to the community. And we also organized some events in which we saw a significant uh, international participation. For instance, this is uh, one of the major events that we organized last year, the second Roman Yushkevit Symposium in September, for which we received a very generous support also from our institute. So we had over 70 participants, uh, more than 70 participants from more than 15 countries. We had 55 talks. Our group was actively involved uh, both in scientific advisory board as well as the local organizing committee. And we also contributed to talks and posters during the symposium. Now going to the scientific aspects, our group is mainly involved in four different, though connected topics in cosmology each with the objective of understanding the underlying physics that governs the formation and evolution of large-scale structures. So first is the PASSIS project in which we aim to improve the redshift estimates of large-scale observations. So as we know, redshift is one of the most fundamental quantity in cosmology and uh, is, a, is used as a proxy for distant, distance measurements. And obtaining accurate redshifts is one of the goals of modern cosmology. So taking this as the motivation in this project, we aim to uh, employ very sophisticated machine learning algorithms in order to generate uh, complete and pure galaxy samples from cosmological imaging surveys, uh, with, uh, which will have very precise and accurate uh, photometric redshifts. And this we will further use to produce new catalogs of galaxies. So presently we are involved in the kilo degree survey and the four most surveys, but we also intend to uh, use our pipelines for more larger surveys in the future, for instance, LSST. And we will use the uh, new catalogs that we will obtain for uh, in these large surveys for getting better uh, uh, cosmological parameter estimations. For more uh, details about this work, I uh, encourage you to visit Anjita's poster. 
our group, other than observations, is also involved in uh, working with cosmological simulations. For instance, in this Vertigo grant, we are testing the theory of gravity and dark energy on uh, large cosmological scales. For this, we are using uh, cosmological simulations in which we simulate our universe with dark energy, uh, with dark energy paradigm different from the standard lambda or the cosmological constant. And we use the simulation results in order um, uh, we use the simulation as the results in order to study large-scale density fields in these uh, beyond uh, lambda CDM models, which have a different structure formation than what we would expect in standard uh, uh, standard structure formation paradigm. And also, we model various nonlinear quantities that is very useful uh, in uh, anal analyst, an analyzing the large-scale surveys. For instance, in my work, I was uh, I was focusing on um, modeling the matter power spectrum in these beyond general relativ general relativity models. So, power spectrum basically it quantifies the fluctuations of density fields in Fourier space, and is one of the fundamental tools that we use in uh, structure formation scenarios. And it also offers as an input for many other cosmological observations. So probing uh, nonlinear power spectrum to nonlinear, uh, non more nonlinear scales is also one of the fundamental goals of modern cosmology. And in our work, we uh, do this for different, uh, different models beyond GR. And we can see here in the bottom where I compare the modified gravity to lambda CDM results that all these models, they have a very distinct departure. Um, I also uh, model the dark matter halo abundance, quant uh, or termed as the halo mass function, in these beyond GR scenarios. So basically, halos are uh, gravitationally bound objects in which baryons cool and condense to form the universe that we observe. So obtaining halo abundances or their observational counterparts or the cluster abundances, it can actually help us to constrain many cosmological parameters and is widely used in many observational studies. And we show in our work that the modified graph, then that if when we have plot this ratio of halo mass function in these beyond GR scenarios with respect to lambda CDM, again, all models, they have a distinct departure. Uh, based on very similar work is Mariana's work in which uh, she models the pairwise velocity uh, distribution of dark matter in these beyond GR models, and uh, because it has been shown that this quantity is a very is a very powerful test of the theory of gravity on large cosmic scales. But we do not see our universe as a simulation box. We see our universe as a light cone in which different distances, they correspond to different times in the cosmic evolution. So here the significance of Powell's work comes in where he constructs light cones for these, uh, for these uh, models that we are using. And uh, he studies angular clustering in these models. And he showed that the clustering statistics can be actually used to quantify departures from lambda CDM. He did this study for simulations, and now he's using uh, actual observed data to, uh, for the study. And again, I uh, encourage you to visit his poster for more details. Earlier, we, tested, we are testing the theory of gravity on large scales. We, we are also testing it on small scales under the Lustre project, in which uh, we are building constraint simulations for these models. So what are constraint simulations are basically simulations in which we have observational constraints, like we know what we want to see in our simulations. And um, since we know that uh, we have very tight constraints in our local universe, so mostly these simulations are done for local universe to understand uh, the impact of large-scale environment uh, on the local universe, and also study the galaxy formation history, for instance, of our own Milky Way or for the Andromeda galaxy. And we, in this project, we extend to beyond lambda CDM models in order to explore observables of modified gravity signatures within our local universe. Uh, again, in the, in the Collab project, we are again probing the small scales, but this time with the intention to test the nature of dark matter. So here we employ very high resolution cosmological simulations in order to study subhalo and galaxy properties. Like for instance, here is the subhalo abundance for different cosmic environments. And we also intend to do this for different dark matter models. So this exercise will actually uh, help us to break the degeneracy 
which we get from the effects of dark matter, using different models of dark matter, or using different cosmic environments on large-scale structure properties, and would be a very powerful tool to constrain, uh, to give observational constraints and to discriminate between different dark matter models. Again, I encourage you to visit Fevin's poster for more details on this work. And uh, before concluding, I would like to advertise uh, the summer school that our group is organizing this July. Uh, first, we would like to acknowledge the great support that we are getting from our institute in the organization. In this school, we will aim to uh, study uh, how we can uh, handle cosmological data from simulations as well as obs from observational observations using numerical tools. And we will open the registrations for the school from this Monday. And on behalf of our group, I would like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to take some questions. Thank you. So thank you, Zuhani. Questions? There is one question already. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. It seems that you have accumulated quite a knowledge in machine learning techniques. Is there any way how your group can diffuse it to other research groups who might be also interested in applying this technology? I mean, in our institute? And uh, maybe this machine learning, it will be a topic during this school or not? Uh, yes, uh, it will be a subtopic within the statistical techniques. So, so we should all go there and... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's thank Suhani again. And this brings us to the, to the last presentation. The second last, because I will have to test something at the end, but now we have uh, Jarek Korbic. Uh, Jarek, you can use this microphone. This is working. You can start, please. Hopefully. Hello. So I'm the last one before, uh, uh, between you and the lunch, so I'll try to be uh, quick. And I'll try to give first time in my life a presentation without a single formula. So let me first um, uh, present the, uh, uh, the topic. So um, mm, uh, we are work working on uh, open quantum systems and the coherence theory, and in particular, the, um, uh, the interest is in the quantum to classical transition. So the, maybe just to give you a brief, um, a brief feeling of what, uh, what we are doing and what we are interested in. So, uh, uh, we all know that the world is non-ideal and we always have to deal with the environment, uh, which especially is uh, especially influential in, uh, in a quantum regime, introduces a lot of, uh, usually a lot of trouble, introduces noise, introduces, uh, introduces errors. However, if uh, one looks deeper, then there is this idea that what we perceive as classical, as the classical world of everyday experience, is actually something that is being born out of, uh, uh, out of interaction of quantum systems with, um, uh, with environment. Okay? And this is something that we, we have been um, mainly researching, especially uh, a thing that was started by Wojtek Żurek and collaborators, the information that um, environment receives about the quantum system uh, for um, many decades since, uh, uh, since the theory of decoherence was, or the theory of influence of the environment on the system was born somewhere in 63, probably Feynman Vernon paper, uh, environment was treated as an evil as something bad, as something that has to be that has to be somehow lived with, but has no uh, no practical meaning. And then comes the observation that actually most of our everyday life is uh, brought to us by the environment. So what what we hear, what we see, is brought to us by a, uh, waves, either electromagnetic or acoustical. So all our Almost all our observation of the outer world is um, um, is indirect, is mediated by by a medium. Well, this has a very nice 
Uh, this has a very nice um, uh, representation in the quantum theory under the name of uh, quantum Darwinism. We have our own version of that, which is called spectrum broadcast structure, which we have been researching. But not only that, also, also other um, environment and decoherence related topics. So the group, uh, apart from um, uh, senior staff, so me and Karol Rzeczkowski, there is a, uh, where's the laser? Oh, that's the laser. So uh, uh, there is a, a PhD student, uh, Taihun Li. Uh, you can see DR. Yes, uh, Taihun has already one PhD in uh, particle physics. Now he is changing to quantum information and, and, and uh, quantum dynamics. Ah, I forgot to mention. So we approach the, 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 the open quantum systems, which is a huge topic uh, being. Uh, uh, explored since uh, probably 80s, we approach it with uh, modern quantum information tools. Uh, so, uh, Taihun is a um, PhD doing his second PhD <coughs> with us. Um, uh, Utam Singh, who was a postdoc for, uh, for two years, he has now moved to Harish Chandra Research Institute, so he's back, back to his home country, to India. And there was a very talented young person, Veronika Nosiadek, who uh, did her master thesis uh, under my supervision, defended last year at Warsaw University. And uh, unfortunately, she left science. And I'm still crying because the, 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 the person was really uh, exceptionally talented. And we have a new, uh, new postdoc. Uh, Masaya Takahashi, who has just arrived, who has just joined the, uh, just joined the team. Preprints um, um, and publications. Um, uh, so there is a, a nice effect, which I will, I will tell briefly in, in what, uh, what follows, what we call a purifying teleportation, where the effect of the environment, instead of being detrimental, actually it is not. It's some, some sort of a fun and surprising, and surprising thing. And there is a publication of uh, Carol with the, with the co-authors. I'm sorry, I don't know much about it. And there is something which looks at the first... There is a paper which looks at the first uh, um, glance uh, strange um, by um, Utam Singh and the collaborators, which appeared in Physical of Applied. Actually, it's quite interesting because the authors use the methodology of quantum resource theory to study something very, very practical, namely a uh, noisy transient uh, voltage sources. I, I was surprised to see it myself. And uh, we have also a, a nice paper on uh, no-go theorem for a um, work extraction using very popular quantum states, so-called Gaussian states, in a, in a decoherence type, uh, decoherence type scenario. And um, uh, also we have a quite a quite a nice paper on a. Um, general framework or general theory how to find out the quantum states which are the closest to classical, so-called so pointer states. And there is also a huge, um, a huge paper of uh, Utam and, and uh, co-authors on uh, quantum computation. Uh, okay, so um, I was... Uh, so I, 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 I prepared one uh, out of those results. I prepared one, namely the, the, the one which is somehow most... Uh, uh, most funny, I would say, and can be presented. I hope it can be presented just using pictures without formulas. Uh, how do I advance it? Okay, so uh, quantum teleportation is a uh, protocol where uh, we, where, where the objective is to pass a uh, given but unknown quantum state from one particle to a target particle. It is achieved by a, a very, mm, very smartly designed uh, protocol that appeared in '96, if I'm, if I'm uh, not mistaken, where a um, 
one needs what we call now a um, entangled resource. This is a maximally maximally entangled state between between two particles, and the protocol is quite smart. Namely, the particle in a, in a given state that we want to teleport is measured jointly with one of the entangled pair. Then the result is communicated via um, classical communication, so basically via, let's say, telephone line. It's communicated to a, a, a second party taking, uh, taking part in the protocol, and depending on the measurement result, the, measure, the measurement is in so-called uh, bell bases, if these are qubits, uh, the, uh, according to the measurement result, there is a, a correction unitary that is applied uh, that is applied to the second particle of the of the entangled pair, and if everything is done correctly, then at the end of the protocol, this particle will be found in this state, and this entanglement will cease to exist. So the protocol consumes one bit of entanglement, so to say. Okay, so that's the theory. But of course, the practice is, uh, and, and, and this is. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the quantum teleportation has been one of the, uh, b let's say, m iconic uh, uh, protocols or iconic uh, effects in, in, in the modern approach to quantum theory and quantum, uh, quantum information. It has now also become very popular um, because of the uh, possibility of building quantum networks. So quantum teleportation is actually uh, considered to be as uh, like a fundamental paradigm on how to distribute quantum information. So basically, how to distribute quantum states along quantum. Uh, only five minutes. Yes. Okay, I thought I. Uh, for, well, okay, all right. So this is uh, uh, this is one of the one of the leading paradigms how to distribute quantum information along quantum network. Okay, but of course. That was ideal world. In uh, in the real world, there is always a noise. There is always this um, environment which is uh, which is coupling, and it m it is m uh, first of all coupling to the most sensitive. And the most sensitive quantum system is here this uh, this entangled pair. Noisy teleportation has been considered for I don't know how many years. I don't know how many papers were written, but this has been. This has been basically studied, but the noise itself was not, or the environment itself was not treated, let's say, seriously enough. It was not treated as a standalone quantum system with um, well-defined quantum interaction with the, with the system that it affects. Now, it turned out that what we did, we, we, we treated the environment seriously. We treated it as like it, treated, it is treated in the open quantum systems. We treated it as a quantum system interacting uh, via quite a general interaction with the, uh, with the entangled pair, introducing noise. But now what happens is that if you smartly perform the teleportation step not twice, but two times, in one force, so in 25% of the applications of the uh, of the uh, protocol the state and the end will be completely noise free that's why we call it purifying teleportation because it the second step purifies what was uh, uh, what was noisy at the at the first step the the, the protocol is is uh, well it's not it's not uh, very easy, but not somehow very complicated either. So we, we perform the first, the standard first teleportation step. Then we uh, feed forward the result of the, of the first bell measurement. According to this result, noisy uh, pardon, a entangled pair is prepared. It is attacked by the, by the environment. This must be the same environment as it was in the first step. Then the second step of the teleportation is uh, is uh, performed. Of course, there are some technicalities. I did not want to bore you with that, but there are some technica technicalities. For example, it must be the same environment that interacts uh, in the first step and interacts in the second step. Yeah, there is no magic. It's not that this state gets purified by some sort of uh, by some sort of magic. It's get purified because the environment builds up correlation with the entangled pair, 
and this correlation, co those co correlations are then somehow injected back into the uh, into the system, which allows to uh, to uh, to actually cancel the decoherence noise in um, one fourth of the uh, one fourth of the of the events. Uh, so now I wanted to advance it. Okay, so that was um, that was uh, that was the basic idea. We uh, sort of used a, um, a very well known, used and abused quantum open system, namely spin boson system, to see how it uh, how it looks like in the spin boson system. So we basically have to uh, just to tell you so. The environment is modeled as a collection of uh, oscillators, bosonic modes, and we have a two qubit register which is coupling via w what is called the pure dephasing, uh, pure dephasing Hamiltonian. And uh, here uh, you can see the fidelities. The red line is the fidelity after the first step. So this measures how close is the final st uh, state at the teleportation protocol to the target state, to the initial state. So this is after one step, and the green one is after two step, provided that we do the, 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 puring, uh, the purifying protocol that, uh, that, uh, that we have discovered. And you can see that apart from very short times, and the time, the time is the time uh, for which the um, uh, environment interacts with the entangled pair. So you see that apart from the from the very short time, and apart from this uh, causal impulse, I, I'll not go into explaining what it is, but you see that the two-step protocol gives the advantage. So uh, on average, this is the average fidelity, so the, the, the fidelity of the average state at the output of the, of the protocol. You see that this fidelity is higher than after one step. I'm done. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I'm sorry, I had to speed up, <laughs> but I'm done. Uh, so now it's time for questions. Uh, let's thank the speaker, I'm sorry. Um, and time for questions. The first question is of Mikolai. A simple question. So teleportations from one place to another. What about s state swapping? Has anybody considered that? Oh, sure. State swapping, you, you even have entanglement swapping, which... Uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but a uh, part of the Nobel Prize or the motivation for the Nobel Prize was for entanglement swapping. So, for example, you can have uh, two particles which never interacted uh, with, them, with themselves. Then you can have an entangled pair and you build a local interaction with the particles and the particles who had never interacted they are found in an uh, in an entangled uh, entangled state so yes you can you can do this kind of magic so did i got it right in case if your environment evolves in time there's no hope for any purification because the correlation will be lost right uh, no not really because actually here uh, here the environment uh, can evolve in time Yes, yes, it is involving in time. Uh, what is, however, what is um, uh, what is important is um, that the timing, the, the, the need to be a precise timing. So the time for which the environment both evolves on its own and interacts with an entangled pair here, and the time it does it here must be the same. Of course, in the practical applications, that these times can be. There, there is a mismatch which introduces a small error, but yes, environment is involving quantumly on its own also. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, actually, I have a question, but ah, uh, so maybe first. Our vice director. Uh, I just wanted to ask whether I uh, understood it correctly. So you apply the decoherence to the maximally entangled state, but not to the state that you want to teleport. Well, you ask difficult questions. In the f as the first approximation, we yes, that is right. As the first approximation, we decided to apply the decoherence to uh, the resource that is most sensitive. So, of course, in, in, in more yet more realistic scenario, we would have to consider decoherence of the um, uh, initial state, decoherence of the of the entangled channel, uh, whether joint or not. Yes, that is true. But uh, if you look 
if you look at the models, the, the, the set spin boson model, so the quantum register decoheres much faster than the single qubit. So we decided, okay, since decoherence is mostly affecting uh, entangled resource, as a first approximation, we use it on the entangled resource. We, we couple it to the entangled resource. Just a small comment. So maybe you can combine your result with what was uh, said by Alex Stratzov during his uh, colloquium. Yeah, yeah, I sent, him, I sent him the paper. Yeah, yeah. No, but what I'm saying is that maybe we first have to dilute the maximally entangled state to many copies of a weakly entangled state and then like apply the decoherence and maybe this would give us or you some improvement. Would that be possible? Uh, very good idea, very good idea. I cannot comment, yeah, but yeah, very good, thank you. Okay, I, I think we have to finish. So let's thank uh, Jarek Korbic and let's thanks for all the talks of, from this session. And I, I'm afraid, afraid that there is another barrier between you and lunch and it's me. And I'm, I'm supposed to give a, some summary of what happened during the last year. Uh, I will try to be relatively quick. So I have a very short presentation, but, but apart from that, <laughs> I prepared a longer report. The report is written in Polish, unfortunately. We are missing the nice figure for the first page of this report. So if you have produced nice scientific figure during last year, please send it to me, then I put it to, as the first page of our uh, annual report. Uh, apart from that, we have this presentation. So what happened last year? We had a photo session. Here we are <laughs> in this room. And now some statistics. So on the left, we have the year 2021. On the right, the last year, 2022. And uh, what matters are, of course, well, scientific achievements are the most important, but the government is looking on how many papers we published and in which journals. So last year we published 111 papers, uh, this year only 88. But last year it was uh, five publications for uh, 200 points. For newcomers, the government is like giving points for every publication depending on the journal at which it was published. And after four or five years, the institute is evaluated. That's why these points are important. Uh, so last year, we have these five most precious publications, and, uh, and two years ago, sorry, and last year, nine uh, publications for 200 points. So uh, in this respect, it's twice better. But we lost, no, not lost, but we published a small number of papers for 140 points, only 46 papers as compared to 78 in 2021. So I would say it's still uh, very good, and maybe I think I think it's good tendency to try to publish it in better journals, even if the number of papers would be smaller. Um, concerning the number of researchers, uh, there is small fluctuation. Concerning our number n, so number of employees, from uh, 42 to 41, let's say. So from 43 to 41. Of course, it's mostly related to. Yes. What does it mean that we have 0 0.6 employees? Yes, uh, it means that the person was there were people working on a, for instance, uh, half of the full time. Or in this case, 0 0.6, 60 percent of time in CFT. That's why we have it. A number of PhD students decreased from 21 to 14, but I would say that the number 21 previously as a bit artificial because because of pandemic many processes were postponed we had uh, phd students uh, who managed to finish their phd uh, recently also last year some of them after actually 10 years uh, so now we have 14 phd students and i guess this is more or less the average we can expect and then concerning projects we have five new projects some of them were mentioned so there, is, uh, there are two Polonis BIS projects, one of Viktor Pergamenszczyk, who was awarded this uh, Polonis BIS just uh, December last year. And uh, Mikołaj mentioned the Polonis BIS of uh, Nezihe Ozun. So Nezihe is here, Viktor is, is there. And then we have also two Opus projects, one is of Professor Rzonzewski and the second of uh, Bożena Czerny, 
There is Opus Lab because this project is uh, will be conducted together with partners from Czech Republic. And there is this Pacific project of Sheikh Sajim. Uh, this Pacific is program which was started by Polish Academy of Sciences and it's founded from a, a European budget. So it's also quite important to us. And last year we're conducting 29 research projects, even more than in 2021. If I would be forced to pick the most three important events during last year, for sure it would be the war in Ukraine. It's changing a lot of things. I mentioned evaluation, that is every four or five years. We had such an evaluation last year, and we finally were given the category A. Every research unit in Poland is given a category after this uh, evaluation. Either C, which is the worst one, B, B+, plus, A, a plus. Well, with this A, we earn like new privileges, so we can award habitations, for instance. And then there was also mentioned that uh, Bożena Czerny was awarded this Lodewijk Voltaire Lecture Medal of European Astronomical Society. I mentioned evaluation, why we had A. Well, the institute is evaluated in three categories. The first category are, are publications. It's 60% of the final result, then 20% are projects, and social impact. Uh, concerning publications, we're in the fourth, fourth place in Poland in physics, and actually five institutes received this A+. And we're considered to A+, so we're close, and concerning publications was really good. It was even better concerning projects, as we're on the second place in Poland. Uh, we lost points in uh, social impact, still being at the level B+. Altogether, we're considered to A+. And the evaluation is such that uh, to be awarded this A+, the, there's some committee consisting of two experts, and they're actually deciding according to their will. And uh, they decided to, both of them, uh, to give us only A, there was appeal written by me and uh, um, Adam Savitsky was director, but finally, uh, despite all these uh, nice results in the first and the second uh, category, were given only A. Uh, so remark, yes, we could maybe prepare even better to uh, write the social impact descriptions. Yes? Yes. This is that, yeah. Uh, if you play a game, there are some rules, and uh, here are no rules. So, uh, there were, for instance, rules which were published. There was some guide, but ministry finally didn't give any strict rules concerning this social impact. It was said that it would be very similar to the British system. So, together with Adam, we went thoroughly through this British system. Uh, and for instance, we're hesitating whether we should describe uh, our efforts in popularization science or not. In British system, it's like zero points automatically, because the social impact is, should be constructed in such a way that we are showing some publications, and then social impact, which is originated in these publications. So science giving something to, I don't know, industry or, or better understanding. But uh, finally, in Poland, it was different. So uh, actually, popularizing was well recognized, even if there were no publications as a base of that. Uh, and this was maybe our mistake. That, uh, then what you should remember, if you work at least two years in CFT, you have to publish at least one research publication, because otherwise we lost a lot of points. Actually, like two, if we have like two people in this uh, N0 category, then we, can, we cannot dream about A+. Some important announcements. So, April 28th, we'll have a scientific council, a meeting of scientific council. If you have something important, or would like to communicate something important to scientific council via your representative, is the right time to think about it. Uh, I'm only acting director, so there will be announced competition for the new director soon. It's managed by Polish Academy of Sciences. And there is a very 
important announcement that we plan huge renovation. It will last like two or three months. Uh, during this time, oh, it's not updated. Uh, what you see here is actually a plan of the floor. There will be many changes during this uh, renovation. Probably we'll move to, uh, we'll rent space in another building, in this building which is just in front of the institute with the big announcement offices to, to rent. <laughs> Uh, another thing, every sept September in Warsaw, there is Warsaw Science Festival. But we need a person who will be coordinating the events organized by, uh, by us. It's not big work, still it has to be a person who speaks Polish, because there are some regulations. And I know that uh, many groups actually promised some outreach in their projects. To have this outreach, you have to have science festival. To have the science festival, we need some coordinator. So let's think about it, because I have to uh, write a declaration uh, on Monday. <laughs> and now, poster session and foot. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> there are questions to summary. Maybe if most of us are here, that's a good time for an important announcement for PhD students. We have changed in the Scientific Council the way uh, rapporteurs are being selected. Okay, So we collect the list of rapporteurs uh, from all the members of the Council and uh, discuss with rapporteurs and only when they agree to be on the list and they have to agree to certain conditions which we set up, then uh, the council selects uh, three rapporteurs for PhD. That means that this procedure uh, doesn't take now uh, half an hour on a scientific council meeting, but more than a month starts more than a month in advance if it's going to be completed. Therefore, uh, we, uh, I, as, a, as a chairman of the council, I would like to uh, remind you that you should remind, uh, or at least contact me sometime in advance, that I am able to start this procedure, right, with sufficiently long time gap between uh, uh, the point before the council has a scheduled meeting. Uh, we, this time we tried more than a month and it, we have an excellent list, long list of, of, of uh, referee reports for which, uh, from which uh, three candidates will be selected. And this is procedure is transparent and absolutely uh, and therefore very honest, and we want to keep it like that. So when the time of submission of your thesis arrives, think about it that I would like to know, I don't know, month in advance, two months in advance, that you will need rapporteurs, because I have to discuss it with the whole scientific council, 36 people, okay? And that, that takes time, because there is a lot of noise. Thank you. Okay, there was also a <laughs> right hand of Victor. Can you please give an example of uh, this institution with A plus? Uh, how many of, of this institution in Poland? I mean. uh, so in Poland, finally, five institutions received A plus. This is uh, Warsaw University. He was, well, we had no, this evaluation, we had no chance with them, to be honest. But then there was Jagiellon University, which would, I would say we were close by if we're comparing uh, our institute concerning publications, citations, and so on. We're uh, on just the physics. I'm speaking only about physics. Yes, this I should mention that. Department, whole physics department or only theoretical no, just all whole physics department, of course. And of course, it's uh, concerning the publications or, or projects, it's then somehow divided by the number of employees. But social impact is not divided, no? So uh, it's easier to them to get something. So Jagiellonian University, Warsaw University, uh, University of Technology in Wrocław, the Nuclear Institute uh, of Niewodniczanski from Krakow, 
And then in appeal, the thief was, uh, I know the Polish name, AGH Academy from Krakow. Mines and, no, no, in English they have Academy, AGH, uh, Science and Technology. Uh, okay, so these were the, the, the five uh, institutes. I don't know. <laughs> You know, the, the rules are changing, uh, situation is changing, you never know. So we're close, but we have I at the end. A. Okay, any other questions? Uh, if not, then I propose that we go to eat something. <laughs>